Hi, my name is Karen Akins, and I am the director and producer of a documentary called The Quietest Year, set here in Vermont. Welcome. Thank you. Um, uh, as, as someone who has lived, lived in Vermont, um, we, you know, we've, we've spoken a little bit uh, before the camera was, was rolling um, about stories in the film that I was familiar with and then uh, people and, and issues that, that I was not. Um, but one of the first things that, that struck me um, and where I think, where I feel um, as someone who loves films and, and loves documentary is the opportunity you have to take a place like Vermont where outside of here I would say probably 99 people out of 100 would think well Vermont's got to be a very tranquil quiet place and say no we're going to talk about noise pollution in our verdant green state. I'm sure that was part of the calculus to do this but could, could, could you talk to me about why it was so important to, I guess, maybe uh, have a little myth bust, busting here uh, about, yes, there, there are serious, serious issues even here in, in Vermont. Well, Vermont is known for its environmental quality, and yet our acoustic environment isn't factored into that at all. We can, we worry about land and scenic environment, so I thought it was really interesting to take our situation here and contrast the real lack of noise control and show um, how we're sort of the, um, even even if it's happening here in a place like Vermont, you know that it's really bad everywhere, but just to, to focus on what our problems are and um, how we go forward will be interesting to others, I'm sure, because we have such a high standard of environmental quality and are we going to match it with doing things about the level of noise in our state, or are we going to let this sort of dichotomy exist between this absolutely spectacular, beautiful environment and then a horrible noise? Right. And, uh, you know, you can't live in a postcard. You know, Vermont looks beautiful on paper. We take pictures, but if you're actually living here, you're exposed on a daily basis to all kinds of excessive noise. Well, and there's a great quote in the film is, you can close your eyes, but you can't close your ears. Um, well, and that struck one of the things, it struck me well, throughout the film is for a place um, and for people who are so aware about so many issues, it seemed like noise pollution is the, I don't know, the forgotten issue, the ignored issue, the, um, and, and it must be frustrating for, for you and for others who are so attuned to it to have people just not think about it in the way that we think about other environmental issues. And, and noise, as we've seen, is a serious environmental issue. It's a serious health issue. Um, I know the word uh, nuisance and annoyance is, is used, but it's, it's beyond that. Um, there, there's the other quote about it's the, uh, it, it's a cardiovascular health issue that a uh, cardiologist can't do anything about. Um, so how, how difficult was it um, to address that, that aspect of it? The grab people by the shoulders and why aren't, ironically, why aren't you listening? Right. Well, that's the temptation as a documentary filmmaker. You always have um, a, a purpose and you want to get certain information across, but you don't want to hit them over the head with it because nobody wants to be hit over right. the head with information. So that's the beauty of um, filmmaking is that you can tell stories that get the information across and move you emotionally, but while also learning some information. And you know the, the level of understanding about noise and its effect on health is so low that right. I figured the best thing that I could do, not just for in my own town, but for everybody involved in noise issues, was just to elevate the, uh, at a very basic level the, the level of understanding about noise and health. Because until you get people to start thinking about that way, you're just not going to make any progress on the right. issue if you're just dealing with 
well, he's annoyed and he's just cranky. You know, right. that's not going to help anybody. But if people start to understand, I mean, and, and the science is very complicated. And that was one of the challenges of the film, like how you measure it and, you know, the health impacts. And it, it's all very complicated. So the point of the film was to have people walk away from after watching it and understand it more as a as a issue and the health impacts and also to create some empathy for noise sufferers rather than what all very often happens is people are just dismissed as is cranky right. and complainers. complainers. So um, yeah. anyway, and I think you know well, from let's the blame the victim. Right, right, right. It's a lot, and so I think from the feedback we're getting, you know, I, we're we're accomplishing those things. You know, right. there are some people that are never going to have empathy for any any victims of anything, and right. we, we can't reach them. But for you know, reasonable people and hopefully policymakers, they'll start to take it more seriously. Okay. Well, I'm curious about your involvement, um, wanting how, how this became uh, an issue for you and why you went from, oh, this is something I'm concerned, I, a citizen, I'm concerned about, I'm going to make a film about this. I mean, did it start with the rooster? Was that, was the rooster <laughs> the, the genesis of this film or was it something? Well, well even, even, okay, I didn't have any personal noise problems until uh, my neighbor started to bring sheep onto the property yeah. next to me. But I was aware of the whole F-35 issue. Right. It didn't affect me personally. I knew about it. In fact, a, couple, a young couple um, in the Burlington area who were downtown residents, I actually um, had just moved to Vermont, and I'd heard that the downtown um, Burlington residents were having problems with nightclub noise. And I said, mm. you know, I actually have some training on urban environments and ha managing noise. So I would love to come and give a talk to the city council and um, talk to, you know, warn them about, you know, driving out residential uses um, out of the downtown with too much noise. And I actually came and I gave a talk. This was a long time ago. And um, they ended up moving out of the downtown, as hmm. a lot of other people did because of the conflict with nightclub noise. Right. And um, one of the people, the couple that I talked to uh, was Doug, uh, Dun Babin, mm -hmm. who was in the film, yep. and I kind of so when I got back, I wasn't living in Burlington. I followed that F thirty five issue, and I kept sort of following it from afar. Like I can't believe that that's really going to happen. I mean, right. uh, the F sixteen's always bothered me when I was you know shopping or whatever in Williston. So I just couldn't believe with all of the activism that that was ac actually ever going to happen. And then it it happened. So. Um, when I started to have my own noise problems, I, I thought, well, you know, this is an interesting issue and it just keeps popping up. So right. I'm going to try to pull something together. And during the pandemic, when I was locked down with incessant animal noise mm -hmm. next to me, I started to f film myself mostly because I thought I was going to enter into a civil lawsuit with my neighbor. And I had, <laughs> so to, you wanted to, and I had to show that I was yeah. bothered. So yeah. I'm like, I can't believe this is happening. You know, so right. I kept pulling my phone out and filming myself on, you know, the worst days. And mm -hmm. I mean, I, during the worst days of the pandemic, when I was so stressed out, I was filming myself, never thinking that it would see the light of day, yeah. but I ended up using some of those clips. Oh, it was of some my... of the most powerful <laughs> clips. I mean, those early mornings. Um, uh, well, so, so you mentioned something that, that I had a, had a, I think you've already answered it, but I'll, I'll bring this up anyway. You could have focused the film entirely on the F-35. Um, uh, I was going to say incident, the F F-35 issue. Um, or you could have focused it on just almost the rural, let's call them natural sound of animals. And um, But you took the greater challenge of going a step further and say it's bigger. It's, it's bigger than any one issue. Um, was there a point where you thought maybe I should pull back and just simplify this and look at just one of these issues and let people connect the dots or were you all like no this this is the opportunity to go go larger um well at one point at an early cut of the film the f-35 story dominated mm -hmm. it was half the film and so um and at that point maybe i wasn't in the film with my own noise problems and so um, we, I, I really didn't want to just have it be about the F-35 because, first of all, it's very political. Sure. And um, 
there is a tendency to label people as unpatriotic right. if they're well, we saw that. standing up yeah. for themselves with that noise, which doesn't belong anywhere near residential right. units. You know, there's 6,000 people in the Burlington area living in an area that's unfit for residential use, according right. to the Air Force itself. So, but I didn't, that because that was so political, I wanted to weave in other stories to give it a bigger context and also to have people, you know, go from what happens to one person mm -hmm. when they're irritated to what happens to a whole community when they're being impacted by noise. The, in each case, the, the victims of noise went through uh, a process set up by their governments, their town government or federal government to like provide input and to you know, uh, tell them what they thought the impact would be and the harm. And in each case, they were totally ignored. Mm. So, you know, I wanted to show that as a pattern, right. that we're not even capable of making, incorporating um, uh, input on this issue because we just, elected officials just don't understand it well enough to deal with it. Right. So I just I, could, I did want to show that pattern um, with different types of noise and then have people think about, you know, they could maybe one person couldn't put themselves in the situation of the F-35, but they might be able to with, with somebody sh shooting yeah. an a, a assault rifle 24-7 right. and, you know, next to their property line. So, right. you know, it, it, I think, helped the relatability for the film to include other things as well. I, I think I agree with that. And I it, it's because, who I mean, for every Michael Shank, there are other people's people out there who maybe are just like, well, I, there's nothing I can do. Um, and this shows that, no, you're not, you're not alone. Um, and it also, in a way, one of the things that was helpful to me in thinking about noise pollution is that it's not just, you know, the automated noise. I mean, it's, it could be what we would term natural sound, but when you amplify it and pro you, you factor in proximity, that is just as damaging. Um, as well. Um, was it cult? I know you felt that it was important to tell your story, but all of a sudden you're becoming a part of the story too. Was it hard to push through that barrier? Um, we tried it so many different ways how to incorporate me in the film. Like, should I be the narrator? Mm -hmm. Should I be a character in the film? Should I be out of it completely? And I would, should I try to tell it in a humorous way. I actually did a short film as a sort of a proof of concept where it was funny. Right. Um, and I was like real deadpan and yeah. I was trying, but you know, we tried it so many different ways and because I had done all the rest of the film except for my piece, I kept trying my, my piece of it in different ways and finally we kind of felt like the tone was good. I couldn't be too complaining, and, but right. I couldn't be too much of an expert and I didn't want to you know, it, it was it was very difficult, <clears throat> and uh, my editor said that was the very hardest part of this film. We had worked together yeah, on another film, and she said just like getting that part of it right and to feel good was very difficult. And I, you know, I very reluctantly participated in the film. I would have been happy not, but I, I felt like I couldn't ask all these other people to bear their souls mm -hmm. and not be willing to show myself at my worst suffering. So, you know, I kind of cool. had to... I kind of had to like take the hit and knowing that I could be criticized and um, made fun of, but I, I just like anybody else that uh, is vulnerable on camera, I had to do it too. Right. No, that's so true, and well, it's brave of you, um, especially uh, in you know, in a living in a community where everybody knows everyone, um, and we, we talked a little bit about um, a screening you have you have coming up. Uh, in your hometown. Um, some of the other uh, filmmakers I've talked to, especially the, the documentary filmmakers, have said those are the ones that are the most, uh, they get most anxious about, um, but also most excited about. Um, how has, even before the, the film screens, what has been the talk in, in your community um, as, as there's been publicity for this? Um, I've heard nothing but positive things here in, in Middlebury. Um, you know, we're very, 
it's uh, with the college here, you know, very eco-conscious, but also uh, community focused. Um, and I, I'm just curious about, but every every town and every location is different. What has been uh, the early uh, talk in, in Stowe? Um, <clears throat> well, because there was a very uh, poor news coverage of my personal situation. And they were poor. Um, the property owner's next door's girlfriend was the one who wrote the article about my situation. So How was that okay? Yeah, it's not okay. <laughs> and so that like established a very false narrative about what was really going on over there. Um, and so when people have seen my film, they're like, oh, I didn't know it was that bad. Or mm -hmm. they, they, and, and uh, my situation with the rooster became a joke. In fact, the head of the select board at our town meeting this year made a joke about yeah. Ricky the rooster. So, um, you know, it's difficult to go from, you know, being the butt of people's jokes to wanting them to even hear your story. And, you know, it's not all about me, but um, I do feel like um, it's, you know, the most of the people and so a lot of people will realize that we as a community um, have to do more to control noise in our right. town. And um, there does seem to be a bit of a, a capture of the town select board where they're representing the uh, builders at the hotel industry. We're not like Middlebury where you have a college. We have a lot of for-profit right. um, interests Focus in our in our tourist tourism. town and yeah. they just want to promote the town and, yeah. and they don't really, they're not looking at as at quality of life for the residents there because they're making their money off of the people tourists, who are coming you know. In. Yeah. So I, I, the film ends, I sat with it for a while. Um, the coda, as the, the credits are rolling up, uh, it's hard because uh, we were coming to the end of the film and uh, it's articulated the solution is you can't run from this. Yet all of the characters in the film have left, where Michael left the state. Um, some of the other younger couples left the area. And it's incredibly sobering. Um, it leaves someone feeling, at least it left me feeling, um, dismayed, but also more eager to make sure more people see this to really understand. Is that why you chose to, to, to end it that way? Well, I mean, so the sort of the tagline for the movie is we can't flee the noise anymore, right. but we are f trying to flee the noise. But I mean, we're, the, I think a lot of people move to Vermont for the quiet, right. for the peace, for the calm, for the nature. Well, where are we, where are we, all of the sensitive people, all going to go yeah. if the, if Vermont's not even that place where we right. can flee? There, there, there won't be any place left. And right. so, like preserving the acoustic environment in Vermont, even if you can't do it in the middle of New York City, you know, like we need to keep this as sort of a refuge and value it as one of our, you know, uh, our assets, our statewide assets. So, I think that's why I I ended it that way, but. Also, I think people realize that moving your home is one of the most stressful yep. things in your life. And these are people that were not willingly leaving their communities. Right. Uh, they were, you know, t having to, to pick up and leave, especially in Michael's case. He had painful. all of his animals and it was very painful. Yep. Um, and, 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 and there are people that, that have to stay, people that right. are poor. Right. That or they may not drive, so they need to live in Win Winooski because they need to be able to walk to right. places. So I mean, so those people can't leave, and so the people that so it's an environmental justice issue. Yeah. All you know, anybody that can will leave, and then the people that are stuck behind are left suffering, yeah. and that's not right, and that's not you know who we are as a people. But you know, if we don't attack tackle it, the issue head on, that's what's going to happen. Well, thank you so much for. Um but doing two things, raising this issue and bringing it to the attention to folks who maybe haven't thought about it, but also giving a name to something that people have been suffering with and not knowing what it was or why. So Yeah, um, I mean, I've gotten some really nice feedback from people that are noise sufferers that are watching the film from other parts of the country. And even though they, these particular noise issues aren't r relevant to them, they say, I 
I'm not the only one. Mm -hmm. they, they see that other people are suffering and they're feeling very isolated. So even for other people around the, you know, the country with, dealing with noise issues, like even pickleball now is becoming a really yes, big it's issue. Huge. <laughs> and people are really suffering yeah. mentally and health wise from that. So, you know, it gives them a sense that, okay, I'm not crazy. So, you know, even if that's <laughs> what we accomplished with the film, that's huge. It's so. a huge step. Well, thank you. Um, enjoy your week. Yeah, thank uh, you. It's and, great to and, be here. And, and best of luck uh, taking the film uh, onward because uh, it's important. Yeah, and I really appreciate the opportunity to screen here at the Middlebury New Filmmakers Festival. I was going to tell people on s Sunday that I'm so glad they didn't name it the Middlebury Young Filmmakers <laughs> Festival because I started out uh, right. making films after I became an empty nester. I'd always wanted to make documentaries and so I, I'm just like, yes, it's new filmmakers. Yes. It's not young filmmakers. And uh, oh, you're not alone. Believe me, <laughs> it, it's it's uh, there are a lot of second career um, folks right. uh, who have found a found a passion. Yeah, that's great. And also this you know week in particular, not to get too political, but you know they uh, there are all these things floating around about the purpose of postmenopausal women and th this is great to this is what i'm doing in in, in my later it. years i'm not taking care of uh, other people's children i'm making films and you know w w women mature women have a lot of wisdom and a lot of life experience and i think More this wisdom is what than most people this I, is what would, we should yeah. be doing we should Absolutely. be doing this not to uh, back in child care so 100%. that's my my two cents <laughs> that's awesome well thank you thank, thank you, you so much for being thank here thank you